Okay, so I'm going to start this podcast a little differently by saying, quick heads up, you may be using a very common phrase or instruction in your webinars, presentations, speaking gigs and events that is actually not an inclusive practice. So if inclusion is important to you in your business and especially if you want to ensure you are being friendly to and inclusive to neurodivergent people and people with different learning styles, you might want to listen up because in today's episode of the Heart Centered Business Podcast, I'm going to share with you how to ensure that you have inclusive learning practices, but also look after yourself as well. And I will explain all of this in this episode of the podcast. This is episode number 373, which means you can find all the relevant links and show notes for today's episode over at tashcorbin.com forward slash 373. Let's dive in. I'm Tash Corbin, and this is the Heart Centered Business Podcast. So this has actually come out of the Heart Centered Virtual Business Conference that I hosted at the start of November 2023. And at Virtual Business Conference, something that I did at the start of every single day was in a very sing-songy way, I told everyone they can learn their own way. You can learn your own way. And I may or may not have sung it even more and more proudly as the days went on. But this was really fascinating to me because the chat box lit up with people saying, oh my gosh, no one's ever said that before. Why is this not the norm? Oh my gosh, that's such a relief. And I also had several people actually um, include this in their feedback for conference, send me specific emails after the first day. Uh, Someone sent me an email like 15 minutes after the opening session in which I had said this. And it was really fascinating to me that this is still not the norm. Now, one of the things that I must say is that I do live in a bit of a neurodivergent bubble in that Unless I'm out specifically engaging in learning from strangers of my own accord, I mostly am attracted to learning from neurodivergent people or neurodivergent friendly businesses. And so because of that, I think I am less likely to see what the neurotypical focused non-inclusive businesses tend to be saying. Now, I also must say, though, that I have heard this phrase uh, and these um, non-inclusive things being said by people who identify as neurodivergent as a reason for why they say it. Um, And I, as far as I can tell, this is just something that just gets handed down from generation of entrepreneur to generation of entrepreneur. So it's time for us to draw a line in the sand. So what I'm referring to is, have you ever been to a webinar or gone to a conference or a presentation or something along those lines? And the speaker says, okay, I want your full focus and attention on this. Um, Close down all your tabs. Sometimes they might say it's like it's time to have a mono focus to ensure that you absorb all of the information. And even um, neurodivergent people share this through the lens of I know for myself as a neurodivergent person that I'm far more likely to take information in if I close down all the tabs and distractions and I really stay focused on the presentation. But something that as a neurodivergent person myself, I understand is that there are different types of neurodivergency and neurodivergent people don't necessarily learn the same way as neurotypical people. And the whole close all your tabs down and give me your mono focus is actually not necessarily the right learning environment for everyone. And so in essence, it becomes non-inclusive. And at speaking for myself, I have been on my fair share of webinars and presentations lately. Uh, I am in a space where I'm learning from a range of different diverse voices at the moment. Um, And I'm going a little further outside my normal learning bubble. And over and over again, I have been told, close everything down, give me your monofocus, da, 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 da. And it makes me feel less than. It makes me feel like there's something wrong with me because I do close all the things down. I'm a very diligent student and I pay attention and I do what I'm told and I have problems with authority. Bit of a people pleaser. And so I shut everything down and I sit there and I try and pay attention. And whilst it might look like I'm paying attention, I'm not. And I'm not taking anything in. And so... 
a lot of people don't recognize that that's what they're doing to learners like me when they say this. They think that they're saying something that's helpful. They think that they're saying something that is going to get undivided attention. But my, my best learning environment is to have visual movement around me as I take in information or in an auditory way. Now, interestingly, that does not mean lots and lots of animations on slides. <laughs> I do not like being spoon fed one sentence at a time on a slide. If I ever attend a presentation or a workshop or a webinar that I can see there's a lot of animation going on on the screen, I turn the screen off, I listen audio only and I go for a walk. Now there are, I know in um, neurodivergent um, and actually neurotypical learning styles, people usually fall into one or other camp. Either they like being spoon fed one sentence at a time or they absolutely detest being spoon fed one sentence at a time. Either they like seeing animated pieces of content come up or they just, just give me the information, right? So I am on the, just give me the information side. So um, all of this to say that you're never going to be able to create something that works for every single learning style because there are so many different learning styles and different things that work for different people. But the one gift that you can give every single person who attends your webinar or watches you speak on stage is to let them learn their own way. So at Heart Centered Virtual Business Conference, every day I started the day by telling people they can learn their own way and not just giving people permission to listen as they walk or do their laundry or tend to their children or scroll Instagram or do what they need to do, but actually encourage people to experiment and play with what learning environment works best for them because I don't think it's modeled enough and we don't give people enough freedom to do that. And in doing so, we make it that this way is the right way and everything else is wrong. So you need to learn how to do it this way or there's something wrong with you. And the more that we learn about different brains and different learning styles, the less that that is actually true. So, if you are listening to this and you feel like really uncomfortable right now because you have used those statements and you that's just a normal part of your webinar because you copied your webinar structure from a certain person on the internet and whatever, it's fine. It's fine. Just as I say to people when they discover that a structure to the sales process that they're using or a social media strategy that they're using is not consent based and their first, well, some people's first reaction is defensiveness and they will defend it like wildfire because they don't want to acknowledge or bend to the belief that they're doing something wrong. So that's often the first response is no, it's not. That's fine. People need to have their first response. But in most cases, the big response is, oh, I feel so bad. Oh, I feel so guilty. Oh, I can't believe I did that. Oh, I've been doing that because I was told to do that, right? Now, once you get to that, uh, that, that light bulb of, oh, I've been doing that. Oh, that feels yucky. Oh, I wish I hadn't. My number one thing that I say to anyone who's experiencing that feeling is, of course you were doing it. It's because that's what you were taught. There's no problem with that. No problem whatsoever. What is important is not what you've done until now. What is important is the decision that you make moving forward. That is the most important thing from here. And my fabulous inclusion mentor, one of my fabulous inclusion mentors, Louise O'Reilly, I'll link to her in the show notes, um, talks about this in relation to inclusion from a diversity perspective as well. Um, and um, one of the biggest challenges that um, inclusion mentors such as Louise have is that the very people who would make the best allies and who would actually have the most impact if they embraced and learned about inclusive practices are the ones who are so scared to set a foot wrong that they do nothing. And that's a real pain, really painful dichotomy. It's like, ah, oh, like, oh yeah, I do want to 
um, include, um, you know, inclusivity in relation to um, gender or inclusivity and make sure that I have more diversity in my programs. But I'm just waiting until I get everything absolutely perfect and I'm 100% sure I'm not making any mistakes before I do anything publicly, if you know what I mean. And actually what Louise says and something that I have, I learned from her many, many years ago now and um, continue to repeat on autopilot almost and with, of course, always crediting Louise, um, is to say that it is better to be an imperfect ally taking action today than to wait and try and be a perfect ally taking action six years from now or six months from now. And so um, it's exactly the same when it comes to learning inclusion. Let's model an inclusive way of um, creating learning opportunities for people. So that's number one. You may not realize that you've been doing it. You may not realize that that's your, um, it's, you know, it's almost like it's an unconscious bias towards neurotypical language and behavior. That's fine, right? You may not have realized now that you see it and now that you understand the decision that you make from here is more important. And so if you are someone who wants to create inclusion, who wants to ensure that you are giving people the opportunity to learn in a way that works really well for them, then let's just stop saying, telling people to close down their tabs. I mean, the very people that you're trying to get to close down their tabs will never close their tabs anyway. They'll just secretly leave them open or they'll turn off their video so you can't see that they're doing something else or they will, um, they will like, look like they're paying attention, but they were scrolling their phone down in their lap or something along those lines. Um, interestingly, like this is just a little fun fact about Tash. So um, when it comes to taking in information from an auditory perspective, my eyes need to be busy. And so if I can't be moving, I, I, actually a whole body movement is best for me. So I listen to most webinars and most um, uh, podcasts, and that kind of thing while I'm walking, riding my bike or driving. Movement, visual stuff going on is, is very good. But there are times, for example, when I'm hosting a conference and I'm the host, I need to sit at my desk. Um, in that instance, for me, the scrolling of Instagram, something that's a very visual platform, is actually me naturally aiming to create my um, best learning environment, either consciously or unconsciously. So um, it was really interesting. I only, I only really uh, uncovered this about myself probably two years ago, the whole visual thing, because I couldn't understand why I didn't enjoy animations on slides when I did identify as neurodivergent. And for a lot of neurodivergent people, they actually prefer spoon feed me a little bit at a time and, um, uh, have it as animated and have a lot of movement involved. Um, and I knew that movement whilst taking in auditory information was important to me, but animations on slide wasn't it. And um, so for me, uh, knowing what I know now about my best learning environment, especially, I keep pointing to my ears, but like especially in my ears is my eyes need to be busy. And so it's really fascinating to me because um, even before I realized what it was, I was someone who, if I'm like listening to watching a TV show, but what's on the screen isn't that important. It's mostly what I'm listening to. I'm, I'm happily scrolling my phone while I'm listening to that TV show. Um, often da the types of movies that David loves, I don't like looking at the visuals, hashtag action films, hashtag a little bit too gory for me. I'm happy to sit and listen to the dialogue and oh, you look, the machine guns are going off. Great. But I don't need to look at the screen to know that machine guns are going off. And so I'm quite happy scrolling through my phone, watching a movie, watching a movie. Seems weird, right? Um, but then even at conferences that I attended, I would be like drawing oracle cards or coloring things in or drawing pretty patterns or whatever it might be. What I was creating was visual difference for myself. So sometimes you might even um, naturally be almost like unconsciously creating the right learning environment for yourself, but not realize. And it's only when, number one, you're made wrong for doing it that you go, oh, I'm not sitting still. Look at that. Isn't that interesting? But number two also may give you some clues as to what is the best learning environment for you. And that brings me to number two, learn your learning style. 
learn what makes the right learning environment for you. Um, there's a lot of evidence now. I've been doing a lot of deep dives into learning styles. Can you tell? Um, there's a lot of evidence now that like the whole visual, auditory, kinesthetic, tactile learning thing is not actually true, that we don't actually have one way of learning. But in fact, every single one of those ways of taking in information requires a different environment for us. And that's really powerful for me because I always identified as a kinesthetic learner. But the reason being was because when it came to learning how to do something, I'd be better off doing it to learn how to do it than reading the instructions. But actually, most people actually take in how to do something physical through that kinesthetic learning style. Um, however, for people who are visual processes, for example, seeing it first before having a go and doing it kinesthetically will often create better results. So anyway, I won't, I won't just spew out my very haphazard um, understanding of these different studies, but it was really powerful for me because I think something that's been a disservice to us is this like box yourself into one learning style. Sorry for those listening on audio only. I just clapped. I don't know why. Um, so that whole <laughs> box yourself into one learning style then goes, oh, well, I'm a visual learner. So then you only experience, you only create visual learning experiences for yourself. Therefore, you never actually understand what you need in order to learn in an auditory way. So then when podcasts become really prevalent, you just keep telling yourself, oh, podcasts don't work for me because I actually take things in better visually. When in actual fact, if you were needing to learn something in an auditory way, you just need to create the right environment for that auditory learning. Fascinating, right? Isn't it amazing? Oh my gosh, it's so good. So all of this to say, take some time to experiment and learn what your learning style is. And that will take practice. Something that was a big learning for me as I, um, pre-COVID, I went to a couple of events and I was learning more and more about my neurodivergence and um, it was suggested to me to take a fidget spinner to an event. I could fidget with it under the table. That movement could actually be really helpful to help me to take in the information. Within three minutes, I was ready to throw that thing out the window. It annoyed me. It, I, don't, I don't need to move my hands, right? I don't need to move my fingers. That's not what I'm looking for when I'm trying to take information. What I need is visual movement, visual movement. So when I'm at events, I will often look at the crowd instead of the speaker on stage. I love a walking, moving speaker. They definitely capture my attention far more effectively. But I also I'm quite happy to like look around the room. It might look like I'm not paying attention, but actually I'm giving myself what I need to take the information in again scrolling Instagram, right? I'm happy to scroll Instagram while I'm sitting at a conference. And so I was at a conference uh, 2000, early 2019 and it wasn't the thing, but that's where I really created that connection for myself in relation to visual learning. And then like visual um, stimulation while I'm trying to take something in auditorily. And then um, deepened that understanding um, in a in the lockdown days, uh, in the no in-person event days, because then it was I had to be at listening via a screen. So therefore, okay, well, what is going to create the right learning environment for me in that instance? So um, I really do encourage you to experiment with different ways of learning, different environments for learning. Um, because you never know, you might actually call, say to yourself that, oh, I'm just really bad with technology and I, I don't, I cannot take in any technology based information, but the best way for you to learn technology based information is simply like by engaging in the process and doing it as you hear it step by step, or it's best that you have someone show you and explain it to you, or it's best that you listen to the instructions over and over again, or it's best for you to have it written out in front of you with visuals. There's so many different ways that you could learn the exact same thing. And so for most people, the way to learn a certain thing is often just presented in one way most of the time. And so we decide I'm just not good at that thing when that's not the case. It's just that the default way of teaching that thing doesn't suit your learning preferences and the right learning environment for you. So take some time to learn your style and experiment. 
you might go for a walk. I um, I can't do a treadmill desk. Can't do it. And yet, out for a walk, listening, fine. But the thing is, it's not just about the movement for me. It's the visual stimulation. It's the change in visual stimulus. That's what's important to my, my brain if I'm listening to something. So, you know, sometimes you need to waste a thousand dollars on a treadmill for under your desk to realize that treadmill desks don't work for you whenever i'm like just a funny story but whenever i was on um the treadmill like trying to do treadmill desk stuff my brain was so fixated on when do i stop when do i stop when do i stop when do i stop that i couldn't focus on anything i just i was like i just need to sit down so i can think for a second and it was so fascinating to me because i honestly thought that it it was the when I would go out and listen to podcasts or um, webinars walking, I thought it was the walking that was the thing, but it was actually the some kind of bodily movement, but it was the visual change, the visual dynamic. Fascinating, isn't it? So my because my visuals are nice and occupied and I'm taking all of that in um, and there's there's no words, there's no nothing, you know, it's not like I'm like trying to take the words in at the same time as what's going in my ears. Just there's visual stimulation and I can kind of, everything's fine, everything's fine. And I'm just so much more present to the words. It's fascinating. Anyway, I won't just keep talking about what my learning style is because everyone is different. But just experiment. Also, I will put a link in the show notes to my favorite YouTube channel, which is How to ADHD, because um, she is an amazing um content creator that's been so helpful for me in setting up my environment for success but also very quick to acknowledge different things work for different people and everything is couched as an experiment try this play with this give this a go um this might work for you this might not work for you this works for me this doesn't work for me um very very helpful and i think that that's actually why i'm so quick to say learn your own way in my own um webinars and events and conferences is because um, that has been so encouraged for me from the How to ADHD um, pr- um, programs. So, yeah, I, I, that, that's not something that they say in terms of there's, they don't do webinars or whatever. But I think because I've heard over and over and over again, even if you're neurodivergent, there's not one type of neurodiverse learning style. Um, everyone needs something different. I've just heard that so many times that, it makes sense to me that in order to therefore be inclusive, let people learn their own way. So um, yeah, just wanted to share that one as well. So number one, let's model inclusion. Let's stop telling people that they're wrong for needing to move around or move their eyes or have visual stimulation in order to learn. Number two, learn what works for you. You may actually be really good at picking up new information if you just create the right learning environment for yourself. And then number three, and this is where we turn it into a selling point for your business is make it a differentiator. So many people said to me over and over again, I'm coming back to this conference every time because I thought I would never be able to learn from a virtual event. And actually it's because you have encouraged us to learn, to create the right learning environment for ourselves. This has been spectacular for me. And um, it is a differentiator for the Heart Center Virtual Business Conference now. It's a differentiator. It's something that I will be showcasing. This podcast is a way of me showcasing that Um, and of showing that I create inclusive learning experiences for people. So have a think about that. And it can even be in relation to people who learn better with others or on their own. So for example, something else actually that we do at conference is spotlighting everyone and um, people could spotlight themselves in the group. We had lists where people could take turns at spotlighting in the call. There's just so many amazing cool things that we do to learn about each other. And something that I was doing in one of our cross promotion challenges was I was checking out some sales pages of other people who are at conference. And what I saw over and over again was that the group opportunity to learn was cheaper than the VIP one-to-one opportunity to learn. But it was almost like, oh, you have to learn in a group was an apology. 
or like at, at worst, it was an apology. Um, in order to make this affordable, it needs to be a group learning experience, but it'll be capped at 20 people, I promise, right? It was almost like, oh, I'm so sorry you have to learn with other people, but well, there will only be 20 of them, so it's okay, right? For me, as someone who is extroverted, I get energized by being in the presence of other people. Body doubling is really powerful for me. I actually learn better in a group. You apologizing for the group learning environment almost sells me out of it. But if you actually shone a light on how that is very um, powerful for people who do well in group learning environments, if you're neurodivergent and love body doubling, then the group, you're going to find the group calls really powerful because we're all going to be there together, right? Like there's all these amazing things that are benefits to your group program. And here you are apologizing for the fact that we have to do it with other people. Hang on a minute. So I just thought that was one little example. Um, but I think that the, you can actually make this very forward in your business as you get better at it. So something that um, I'm getting better at doing and making more forward in my business is even in my one-to-one -one packages, I have uh, a few people now who we do their sessions moving, walking. So they're walking and I'm walking when we do their session and uh, we record it so they don't have to take notes. It's fine. Like everything that we're discussing is going to be covered. And for them, they feel like they are more able to express themselves fully and um, they are in a more creative space. And I actually do very well walking and thinking at the same time and talking things out. And so um, we, I have two VIP clients in particular that I'm thinking of where every second session of theirs is a walkie talkie session. So um, that is something that will be far more forward in my business as well as a unique selling point. When we do our sessions, we actually do them. We, you can do them on the move. And so it's not only being inclusive and being okay with people learning their own way. It's actually making it forward in the message because it's a differentiator. So I want you to think about all the different ways that people can work with you rather than seeing, oh, the VIP is way better because it's one-to-one -one and the group program, well, it's not as good because it is a group, but you know, it's cheaper and there's, less, there's not that many people in there. Instead of seeing it as less than, highlight it and put it as, well, what are the benefits of that? Because in a lot of cases, you're underselling the very option that for a lot of people would be the best option anyway. And so um, rather than apologizing for it, make it a hero part of your messaging. Make it a stronger forward part of your messaging. So they are my three things. Number one, let's model inclusion. It's okay if you've been telling people to shut all their tabs and pay attention and sit up straight, but let's maybe not do that from here. Um, number two, learn what your best learning environment is for different types of information that you need to take in, for different thing, ways that you want to learn things. And then number three, make this a hero message in your business. Let's embrace it so much that it becomes a differentiation point. Not only are we creating far more inclusive learning opportunities for our clients and for our audience, but also if I had to choose between someone who spotlighted the way that they create um, unique learning environments and um, are flexible in how people take in information versus someone who doesn't speak about that at all, I would go with the person who speaks about it because I know what a difference it makes for me in terms of the results that I get from what I'm investing in. So let's model inclusion. This You may have found this a little challenging to take in or you feel a little bit like, oh, I realize I'm doing it wrong. Um, as I said, line in the sand, you get to choose what you do from here. But also one of the big things that came out of conference was the more I talked about the learning environment I needed from a neurodivergent ADHD perspective, the more people were like, oh, maybe I'm ADHD because that really lands for me as well. And that really lands for me as well. So get to know yourself could potentially be a thing. Actually, I'm going to like take a little sidestep at the end. If you are someone who is like, am I neurodivergent? Maybe I might be. I just want to, and particularly if you are, um, were raised um, female, AFAB, um, assigned female at birth, um, I have another little rant that I want to give. But before I go into that, 
I do just want to quickly plug Heart Center Virtual Business Conference because the next one is in March 2024. And um, if you buy your tickets earlier, you will be more likely to be selected as a speaker because I am actually going to be selecting a lot of the speakers for virtual conference next year from the ticket holders. It's a way that I reward people who buy tickets. Um, And I support those who support the event because the event is a community-based event. So if you support the event, you're supporting the community. I support the community, support the event. It's like this whole spiral thing. Anyway, um, so make sure that you go and check out Heart Center Virtual Business Conference. Um, If you use the coupon code POD50 at checkout, then you'll get 50 bucks off your ticket. So I'll make sure that that's in the show notes as well. Um, And uh, get your tickets sooner rather than later. If all of what I've been talking about in terms of learning styles is like really opened your eyes, you wait till you experience conference. Honestly, it is so beautiful. It is so inclusive. It is so loving. It is so flexible. It is so valuable. There's so much connection. There's so much networking. There's so much spaciousness for people who need to introvert. There's so much opportunity for you to create the conference experience that works exactly and specifically for you. And yet creates so much transformation for everyone involved. I cannot even like, honestly, it has been spectacular and I'm going to be running virtual conference every year in March, I reckon from here. So we'll have virtual conference, March in-person conference, September, most years moving forward. Um, And so the more that you attend these conferences, the more people you'll get to meet, the more you expand your network. Remember your network helps to maximize your net worth, all of those sorts of things. Please do come and check it out. That was a terrible sales pitch for virtual conference, but I did want to mention it before I dived into my final thought and that final thought is I was and I wasn't planning on saying this by the way but I was listening to another podcast and they had a guest expert on I'm sorry I can't remember the guest expert um their name if I can find the link to the podcast episode I will link to it in the show notes but I'm not sure that I will be able to because I have been it was months ago but I was listening to this podcast and it really landed for me so I just want to see if it lands for you And that is that they were talking about the under diagnosis of ADHD and neurodivergence in girls in particular, young girls in the classroom. And I, of course, you know, I'm, this is going to sound very uninclusive in terms of gender identity, but if you were assigned female at birth and especially if you're early um, introduction into the classroom was as a girl or identify as a girl, or being identified as a girl, this will be particularly important. But what this psychiatrist was saying was that the societal norms of how girls and boys are raised at the, in the home are so different and often unconsciously different that it is one of the main contributors as to why autism and ADHD are under under diagnosed in girls and that is because girl for girls especially in the formative years it is important or it is being it is thrust upon them that societally it is important that they are seen as polite and politeness the standard of politeness we expect of girls is not the same as the standard of politeness we expect of boys now I hope and pray that for every person listening here who is a parent, that they are rejecting gender norms and binaries and all of those sorts of things. And it's probably not you, but the way you were raised, right? I'm talking about what was done to you, not what you were doing to your children. I'm not a parent. I'm not a parenting expert. I do not profess to be a parenting expert, nor would I ever want to give any kind of parenting advice to anyone. However, If you are someone who is probably over the age of 20, 25, it is likely that you experienced this treatment or training or programming that it is very important to be polite. Girls are raised with far more fear of authority than boys because boys tend to get away with more or tended to get away with more. Um, boys are naturally boisterous, so they are allowed to blah, 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 blah. Girls are naturally carers and nurturers. So let's give them all babies, you know, pretend babies and nature versus nurture, right? Totally understand all of that. I'm not going to go into that debate. What this psychiatrist said though, was that when girls and boys enter the classroom for the first time, 
girls already have so much programming around politeness and paying attention, being quiet and listening versus boys that their ADHD or learning challenges go undiagnosed far longer because girls know how to mask far more effectively because we we our, our loudness and boisterousness was not tolerated as well and I can recognize this for myself it really landed for me that I did very well in the classroom environment because I knew how to play the game I was very good at taking information in very quickly I was not good at sitting and paying attention in the classroom learning environment, but I was good at faking it. I could absorb out of books and textbooks things super quickly and then sit and stare at the teacher as though I was paying attention and being a very good student. And it was just fascinating to me how this was presented um, and how much this would contribute to the underdiagnosis of ADHD in girls because it presents in a very different way. Part of the reason why it presents in a different way for girls is a different developmental phases for different ages, for different genders, uh, for different sexes. But a big contributor is also this... Um, cultural or societal norms about gender roles and gender expectations. So um, loud boys are leaders, loud girls are bossy. Um, loud boys are just boisterous and energetic and loud girls are disruptive. Um, la loud boys are, uh, you know, um, boys who fidget and move around a lot uh, just have a lot of energy to burn. Girls who fidget and learn uh, and wriggle around a lot are being um, uh, are being naughty, right? Like there was just so many examples that this person gave, and I was just like, oh, "That is so true. That is so true." So, I think that this is an important little conversation, just a little pl seed to plant. Now, I just want to say this through the lens of one: I'm not an expert. Two: Please go and. If this is really resonating for you, just go and watch a few videos from How to ADHD. Just whatever strikes you, just watch it. Because honestly, watching their content was powerful. So that was number two. Number three is uh, psychologists and psychiatrists have far more research and far more insights as, as to how these things express and why these things express and um, how to um, really differentiate. But also number four, and this is a big one for me, is that Whenever I have expressed my belief, especially in the early days, like in 2016 and 17, when I was starting to think that potentially I was neurodivergent and had ADHD, whenever I would express it to someone who knew me as a student, the first thing they would say is, but we were really good at school. And just because you're really good at school, we are also overachievers here in this little community, aren't we, right? Just because you were good at school doesn't necessarily mean that that school environment was built for your learning styles. It often means that you were just better at adapting yourself to that environment because that's what was expected of you because you were assigned female at birth. And so I wanted to have that conversation because I think for a lot of people, there is a reluctance or a hesitancy to even go there, even ex accept it or explore it or allow themselves to... Um, uh, dive into that exploration or have a conversation with a psychologist or go and have some testing done because it's it's seen as either being less than or it's an easy out or I'm just looking for an excuse or I went through all of that. I went through all of that because it was thrust upon me by the people who love me the most and who knew me the best because of their experience of what I was like as a student in the classroom. And for me, it was just so validating to hear that psychiatrist say that for a lot of women in particular, for people who were assigned female at birth, their experience in the classroom was that of masking. And because we were so good at masking, now as adults, we are so hesitant and reluctant to tell those who knew us in that environment about our beliefs or worries or wonders about this neurodivergence thing because 
whenever we do express that, that's the first response is, you were so good at school though. You were so well-behaved at school. You were such a well-behaved child. You were, re- you were straight A student because I was a straight A student, right? So there was no need to go and see if Tash was ADHD. There was no exploring Tash's neurodivergence. My brother was wildly ADHD and it expressed very differently to my learning difficulties. His learning difficulties and my learning difficulties were like chalk and cheese. Um, and because my grades were so extraordinary, there was never the, 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 the challenges that I had, the frustrations that I had, the, the um, issues that I had were often couched as just laziness and leaving things to the last minute instead of being explored or, and understood. And I just know that for every person that I say that to, uh, I see this like sense of something cross across their face. And so if I have a platform like this in order to, in which to share that and to have that little rant, whether it resonates with you as a neurodivergent person or not, or whether you're neurotypical and all of that just sounds like a load of weird stuff, but maybe it will make you a little bit more understanding or a little less likely to say to someone, but you were so good at school. I just want us to have that opportunity to have that conversation. So I know that I've butchered it. I definitely didn't present it in a very well articulated or thought out way. I just decided to add this at the last minute as I was speaking, but I, it just, for me, it's something that I believe I would have had a far more um, effective start as an entrepreneur. I would have had a far better experience of the workplace of my schooling experience, of university, if not for gender bias and roles. And I also feel that I would have got the help that I needed with my neurodivergence far quicker, if not for this belief that my ability to mask actually meant that I didn't have learning challenges or neurodiversity. And um, so it's like, it's, I just had to express it. I will likely do this as a Facebook live over and over and over again as well, because I think that the more voices we hear, um, sharing those experiences and all of those different reasons, I think the more of us that actually will then be open to creating a much more effective environment for ourselves to succeed. And that's what I want. Um, This psychiatrist also shared some statistics around the number of people who are neurodivergent versus the number of people who are diagnosed neurodivergent. And the difference is far greater for women than it is for men. And um, they also linked this back to a lot of the gender norms and stereotypes and um, the the societal expectations of people assigned female at birth compared to people assigned male at birth. And so... Um, it, it was, it was a really big difference. So, um, it's something, it, it, the ballpark was like 7% of people are neurodivergent, but 1% of women are diagnosed and 6% of men are diagnosed. It was like huge. It was such a big difference. And so, um, if any of this resonates for you, please do like, just spend some time, like allowing yourself to, without judging yourself as being less than or without, you know, making it mean that you must be lazy because you're looking for an excuse as to why you leave things to the last minute or why you can't get anything done. Just, just let's throw all of that stuff out and just give yourself that gift. Thank you so much for listening to that rant. I hope that it's been helpful for you, or at least it's opened your eyes to other learning styles. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions, I'm, you're welcome to send me a DM or email me. Um, I will make sure that I put some resources in the show notes of today's episode. It's at tashcorman.com forward slash 373. I'll just put a bunch of links below that I found really helpful for myself. Um, and until next time, I cannot wait to see you shine. I hope to see you at the Heart Center Virtual Business Conference 2024. And I also look forward to seeing you give yourself a great learning environment and role modeling inclusive learning strategies for your audience as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Big love from me and bye for now. Would you like more tips, tools, and resources to help you grow your heart-centered business? Head to tashcorbin.com today.